Okay, hey, welcome to the Night Church Church Service. Okay, cool. So we are working our way through the books of the Bible. Uh, we have worked our way through the entire Old Testament. Come on, say, I made it through. And tonight we are starting the book of Matthew. Grab the note sheet for me. Wave it at me. Okay, so we're gonna be in the book of Matthew tonight. Uh, I am gonna nerd out for a few minutes because I, I was first a theology teacher before I was ever a pastor. So I'm, I'm gonna get to some good stuff that's applicational in a little bit, but I really have to teach you a little bit about Matthew because there's this show out there, The Chosen right now. Uh, who's ever watched The Chosen? Your hands. Okay, a lot of you have, okay. So the idea you have of Matthew is uh, he's maybe a little bit autistic uh, and kind of shy and reserved. Um, and uh, God called him to, to, Jesus called him to be a follower, which is awesome. I love the idea of that. That's a beautiful like, way in which they decided to, make, to develop the character. It was awesome. I love the show. Uh, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about the real Matthew, and it might not be much like the show, but more like what, who he was really like, and it's a little different. So uh, before I do that, I'm going to pray. Look at the person next to you and say, it's okay if we nerd out a little. It's okay if we just nerd out a little. Okay, good. Lord Jesus, thank you for every life in this room. Thank you for those watching online. I pray favor and blessing over every heart. We thank you that they are paying attention and eager to learn your word. I pray that tonight, tonight that this is not just informational, but it is transformational. Even as we do some nerd stuff at the beginning, I pray that this turns into something really beautiful for their hearts and minds, and it radically alters them forever. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Leave me now, Jesus. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so some stuff about Matthew right away. So it's book 40 of 66. The author of the book of Matthew would obviously be who? Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector that Jesus calls out of a dysfunctional life to follow him. That's Matthew 9, 9 through 13. And Matthew becomes one of the original disciples. Now I'm going to stop for a second and talk to you about tax collectors. Tax collectors were people who have rejected their Jewish roots. And they decided that they would rather be Greek or Roman than Jewish. So they're going to practice sexuality like the Greeks and the Romans practice sexuality. Uh, they're going to dress by shaving their beards. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to go toga like the Greeks are going to go toga. They're, I mean, they're, they're going to reject their Jewishness in favor of being, uh, of being Greek. Now, in order to do that, like to be a tax collector, you get to collect taxes from all the people that used to be your friends. And you can charge whatever you want. Like the IRS tells you what you're going to pay. That's not how this works. Roman soldiers would be like, hey, uh, taxes are 200 bucks a year. Sweet. Uh, but because Matthew is the tax collector, he can decide, decide to charge 300 just because he's the collector. Or 400 or 500. He can charge whatever he wants. That's how he makes his money off his people. And so he would walk up to a door of a home and knock on the door and be like, hey, time to pay your, your taxes. Uh, your taxes are 400, even though they're only 200. And they're like, but that's too much. I can't possibly. And, and then there's two Roman soldiers behind him. And he says, well, if you don't pay your taxes, these guys are going to break your legs or rape your wife. That's the system we're in. And Matthew had decided money was more important than people. He's basically, if we're going to put it in a modern context, Matthew is a drug dealer. Matthew is a pimp. Matthew is selling drugs to the people he should be loving and gaining money and interest off of people he should be kind and caring about. I mean, he's a, he's a thug who not, wants nothing but stuff for himself. He's more like a hell's angel than what you're seeing in relationship to The Chosen. Now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing The Chosen. I think it's wonderful. It's a great, it's a great show. I'm going to keep watching the whole thing. But the idea I'm trying to get you is, have you, have you ever, now I'll ask you a question. Have you ever been around somebody who was like a drug dealer and then they turned to Christ and God radically altered them? Can I see your hands? Put your hands up. Leave them up. Look around. These are people who are super broken, jacked up, angry, violent, kind of rough people and yet Jesus still called them despite the fact they were super dysfunctional. Come on, say God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Look at the person next to them and say, you're not too dysfunctional. <laughs> See, now, immediately, now we've applied this. I know we were nerding out for a second, but we've already applied it. That you're not too far gone, no matter how dysfunctional you might have become, no matter how jacked up you might have been, that God can still transform you if you will give your life to Christ. Is that good news? If it is, make some noise. See, now that's good news. Any, come on, say anyone can follow Jesus. 
You got it. That's the, Matthew was proof of that. Now, the type of literature will be history or a story. Moses or, or Matthew is one of the four gospels telling us the good news of Jesus. So we go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and usually like, okay, we got four gospels, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I want you to get. When he wrote these books, he was like, I got to reach my friends. Just like I was, I was hurting my friends. Now he's like, I, I got to reach my friends. I, come on, say, we got to reach them. So he's doing whatever it takes. And he's like, I, I can write. I'm a pretty good writer. I'm gonna write it down. I'm gonna get it to everybody. And he starts sliding this gospel out to all his family and his friends and his neighbors and his coworkers. He's just sliding out the story of Jesus to other people and it catches on. And we're reading this book 2,000 years later because he just, come on, he, he wanted to read some friends. Come on, see, I want to read some friends. That's literally what all four of the gospels are. They're just trying to reach your friends. His audience, he's writing to the Jews because that's who he was. He's writing to a Jewish audience seeking to help his people connect with Christ. He starts his book with a genealogy specific to Abraham and David as Jewish leaders, and then he identifies Jesus from the tribe of Judah, which might not mean anything to you, but he quotes from the Old Testament more than 60 times to connect with his Jewish audience. He's just trying to, come on, say, reach your friends. He's just trying to talk in such a way that his friends who are like him, who are Jewish, would understand the gospel and maybe want to follow Christ. Now, just for a second, I'm going to push pause. I'm going to put up a grid for a second. The reason why there are four, God, can you put that on the screen? Thank you. The reason why there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that each has a different audience and a different focus. They're not just repeating the same stuff. They're literally, come on, say, they're on an agenda. They are on an agenda. Matthew's writing to the Jews, and he's trying to say Jesus is the Messiah or the King. Mark is writing to the Romans. Jesus is the suffering servant who ministers to our needs. Luke is writing to the Greek. Jesus is the perfect son of man. Because you ever notice like Greek statues are always like the perfect human? They're always trying to show off, like they're always naked and they're always like a, a, some dude who's like buff. Like, because the Greeks were always after the perfect specimen of human being. So Luke writes to, that Jesus was the perfect son of man, come to save us. John writes to everybody because Jesus is God in the flesh and he's trying to prove that Jesus is actually God himself. So each of these gospels are designed to tell you something different to the audience that they're trying to reach. Once again, they're come on, say, let's reach our friends. Oh man, these four gospels are four different books just trying to reach the people that are most like them. Now the date of writing for this whole thing is David, Matthew writes about the events, the, the events of Jesus' life. He's in, uh, they're just basically his memories. Come on, say memories. Imagine you had spent, got to spend three years with Jesus and all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm getting old. I don't want to forget this stuff. Would you want to write them down? That's what he's doing. He's just he's writing, oh, remember this one time? That was so cool. I got to write that. He's got these stories that he just, I guess, I mean, he's just trying to write down of what he remembers of his, of his time with Jesus. The most likely date of writing is somewhere around 62 to 69 AD. I thought this was super cool because I'm nerding out for a second. Dr. Edmund Hebert says this, Matthew was the most widely read gospels of the gospel of the early church. So this is the one of the four that they read the most. They had this one before they had the other ones pretty much basically. The early church fathers quoted more from this book than any other book in the New Testament. And what's really awesome is our oldest fragment of Matthew is from the second century, so early like, like 120s, 140s, one, like early, early, early 200s. So check this out. This is the oldest fragment left of the book of Matthew. It's called the Magdalene fragment because it is the story of Matthew 26 where Mary Magdalene anoints Jesus' feet with perfume. And this is the oldest little shred of Matthew, closest to the actual time of Jesus that we have on record, which I think is, that's just, to me, that's, that's really cool. Time period covered, the, the Gospel of Matthew is entirely focused on the life of Christ. Jesus is born around three, 3 or 4 BC and dies and resurrects in 30 AD. And then here we're going to get the, to the big idea and where we're going to spend the rest of this time, and this is how it's going to get a little applicational. The big idea of Matthew, he's just trying to say one thing. Jesus is, come on, say one true king. One true king. Jesus is the one true king. And just for a second, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pull this podium out of the way for a minute. Table out of the way, just for a sec. Because in your heart resides a throne. And some person or something is always sitting on the throne of your life. 
in every individual moment of life. Uh, if, if the thing that gets you sidetracked all the time is pleasure, then what might sit on the throne of your, of your life is sex or drugs or pornography or if the thing that, that drives your life is your kids and you're just hovering around your kids, you actually worship your children because that's what you think is most important. If, if, if you're thinking, man, if I could just get my business to succeed, if I could just get my business, if you're always thinking business, business, money, 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 then basically you're a lot like Matthew because what you're doing is you're bowing down to the altar of money. And what Matthew comes along and says is that at some point, not at some point, literally almost every, like literally every day, you gotta ask yourself the question, who's on the throne of your life? Because if it isn't Christ in every moment, you will make stupid decisions and hurt yourself in some big ways. Like this is how, this is how people who like, like I, know, I know this guy's not really good for me, I know this girl's not really good for me, but I just really can't leave him because they're worshiping a guy or they're worshiping a girl and they actually destroy their own lives because they think they have to have them and what they need is Jesus. He's the only thing that's gonna satisfy. Come on, say one true king. So when he gets on this agenda, remember, like I know you're reading, when you read the book of Matthew, which I'm hoping you read this week, you're thinking of it as it's a Bible story about Jesus, no. It's an agenda. Come on, say it's an agenda. He's trying to tell you over and over and over and over and over. He's gonna beat it into your skull. Jesus is the one true king. He says it again and again and again and again. In fact, I'm gonna give you 10 ways real quick. and I'm gonna buzz through them pretty fast that, J that Matthew tries to prove this case that Jesus is the one true king. First, Jesus' ancestry proves Jesus is the one true king. So first he's like, hey, ever go to ancestry.com? Ever, you know, spit in a little vial, send it off. Who's ever done that before? Can you see your hands? Yeah, so, so Holland gave this to us as a, as a Christmas gift a few years ago. And so we got to figure out what, what, what our background and ancestry was. And we, like I, my, my last name is Dykstra, so I figured I'm pretty Dutch. Uh, we got the results back and Kelly's more Dutch than me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, so you kind of like learning. So what Matthew starts out by saying, hey, you know how kings need to be in like the royal family? or the royal line. Matthew starts out by saying, King Jesus is in the ultimate royal family or the ultimate royal line. He starts with Adam, goes through Noah, Abraham, to King David, and then all the way to Jesus. And he's like, then this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. I told you he's better than everybody else. Come on, say he's better. He's a better king. Second, Jesus' birth proves he's the one true king. His birth shows that he's the one true king. So when Jesus is born, he is born supernaturally different than everyone else, yes or no? Yeah, so Matthew chapter one, verse 21 says it like this. She will, be, she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Somebody coming to save us from sins. But how is this a, re a, re a reflection of him being the one true king? Well, when the wise men show up, ever notice what they ask? Yeah. Who is the one who is what? Born king. There's a king coming. There's somebody, and the, the, the king, Herod, is now threatened. So he tries to kill all the babies in Bethlehem because he's so threatened that the king is coming. Come on, say one true king. Third, Jesus' baptism proves he is the one true king. So at the baptism of Christ, something spectacular happens. First, there's this voice, like I know that when we do baptisms down the lobby, we, you're not usually hearing like a voice from heaven going, this is my beloved kid. <laughs> but it happened with Jesus. Matthew chapter three, verse 17. Suddenly a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. You know what that tells you? He's a prince of heaven. He's royalty. In whom I am, what's the last two words? Royalty. So in other words, he is God approved. You got a God-approved king in Jesus. Any other king got that? Nothing. Nobody else compares to that. How about number four? Number four, Jesus' temptation proves he is the one true king. In fact, what's cool about this temptation story is the devil comes and tempts Jesus three times. This is the king of darkness fighting against the prince of heaven. And if the king of darkness loses, it's telling you that, come on, say there's a greater king. 
there's a greater king, and this greater king defeats the king of darkness. How many times? Three times. Why is that important? It's the number of perfection. One, two, three. I defeated him once. I defeated him twice. It's why when we say about God, we say holy, holy, holy. It's holy times three. It's holy beyond what we can ever understand. When he defeats hell in this story, he is defeating him in a bigger way than we will ever be able to understand. Our minds cannot understand how to defeat sin or the devil. Our our strategies just don't work, but his brain is so much better. He's so much wiser that he conquers the devil three times. Holy, 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 conquered, conquered. Come on, say, I am victorious because he is. Come on, say, he's a better king. Number five, Jesus' teaching proves he's the one true true king. Now, what's really fascinating about about his teaching is he's constantly, do you know that, like if I was to say, what's what's Jesus' most famous teaching? People always go, turn the other cheek. That's not what he said the most. In fact, I'll show it to you. Christ's main message was Matthew 4, 17. From this time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the what? kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying, hey, the king is here. Turn, repent. I'm the way. I'm the truth and the life is how he says it in the book of John. He says, the king is here. 56 times in in the book of Matthew, he says the word kingdom is used. 32 times the phrase kingdom of heaven is used. Over and over, he's like, I'm the king. I'm the king. I'm the king. What are you going to do with the king? And they killed the king because they didn't want to worship the king. Number six, Jesus' miracles in the book of Matthew proves that he is the one true king. In fact, in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, Jesus does 10 miracles. Remember how earlier I said, uh, Matthew's kind of, it's just memories, everybody said memories. He's just like, oh yeah, I remember this one time. So in chapter 8 and 9, Matthew just goes on a run. He's like, I remember he did this, that was super cool. I remember, oh, there was this one. And he just, and that doesn't mean they all even happened in this necessary order. Remember, because he's on an agenda. We think about stories in the Bible as this is the chronological order in which they're happening. Matthew's not writing like it's, he's got the beginning, his birth and his death, but in the middle he's like, there was this one and this one and this one, and he's just writing all the things he can remember. And so in eight and nine, he just remembers a bunch of miracles. Why does that matter so much? Because Isaiah said the one true king has to be able to perform miracles. In fact, Isaiah prophesies 800 years earlier, Isaiah 35 and 5 and 6, when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like like a deer, and those who cannot speak will suddenly sing with joy. When he's writing, oh my gosh, he did this, he did this, he's trying to tell you. He is the predicted coming king, 800 years in advance, already predicted, had to do miracles. Number seven, Jesus' triumphal entry proves he's the one true king. So, if you don't know the story, on uh, the week before Jesus, the, the Sunday before Jesus died the, or rose again, Jesus rides on a donkey into Jerusalem and they shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who's ever heard that story before? Can I see your hands? Okay. That's because there was a prophecy predicting that the one true king had to ride a donkey into Jerusalem 700 years before it happened. In fact, this is, this is that text. Zechariah 9.9, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble riding on a donkey. And I'm just going to throw this out there. He's the king of kings over human governments. I'm just throwing that out there because you're in an election season and some of you are freaking out. Do you know that scripture says that we are aliens and strangers here, that this world is not our home? So what you're so scared of? The one true king is ruling and he's going to reign and he's going to figure it out. Yes or no? You got anything to be worried about? Is he surprised by any of it? And stop freaking out. Some of you so, so stressed about human government, but that's because maybe you're, you got the wrong person on the throne. Maybe you got politics on the throne, throne instead of Jesus on the throne because our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. Yes or no? And when you remind yourself of that, man, you're not, like I got the one true king I follow. I don't, I don't, I don't got to stress about what happens in the government. I don't have to stress about what goes on in this thing and that thing. And I don't have to freak out all the time because God's got this under control. Jesus is my one true king. Yeah. I heard somebody say it the other day, and I, Kelly and I have been kind of talking about it. Like, uh, I, yes, 
politics matters in some sense because you need to vote. I agree with that. But if we are aliens and strangers here, not my circus, not my monkeys. I can pray, I can vote, but I follow the one true king. Does that give you some peace of mind? It should. Number eight, Jesus' death and blood proves he is the one true king. Jesus' death and blood proves he is the one true, come on, say royal blood. blood. See there's, now grab the communion I gave you. Can somebody hand me one? I don't have one up here. Thank you. Grab that community. Just go ahead and open it up. So you can peel back the clear part. You're going to get to the cellophane. You peel back the tin foil. You're going to get to the juice. Jesus' death and blood proves he is the one true king. And I'm going to show you this. This is Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. He says on the night before he dies at his, what we call the last supper, this is my blood in the new covenant or new deal, better commitment, which is shed for many for the remission or come on, say removal. removal. So I think, I know a lot of you are like, I'm forgiven, but I still suck. Remission means removal. That's why we say we're totally righteous. Now, how's that possible? And I just put it at the bottom of the screen right here, on the bottom of this little point. His royal blood of heaven is the only thing that can conquer human sin. Heaven conquers earth. His way better than our way. His royal, you're not looking at just Yeah, you're looking at grape juice and a cracker, but what it represents, come on, say royal blood. blood. The royal blood of heaven was spilled for you. Whoa, remission of sins, removal of sins. Actually, we'll even take it further. So if I follow King Jesus, as I take this, I am reminded that not only was he royalty, but I am royalty. Only his followers get to take this. Only his people called by his name, who he has forgiven and transformed, removed their sin. Take this because we are in the royal family, under royal blood with a royal heritage and a royal future. Sacred, special, royal blood conquered human sin. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I'm so grateful that your royal blood removed my sin. I'm so thankful that the people of this house, the people here taking communion right now have been forgiven of their sins if they've given their heart to you, that their lives are transformed. We take this in gratitude that we, ha- we are destined to reign, that we are in the royal family and in the royal line, that we celebrate this moment knowing that your royal blood has conquered what we could never conquer. You conquered our sin and we're so grateful that you put us in your family. Will you eat and will you drink with me? Come on, say Matthew's on an agenda. He is. Number nine, Jesus' resurrection proves he's the one true king. Because, you know, if you can conquer death, can you pretty much conquer anything? Anything greater than death? Nothing. He can reverse death. Now, this is, this is, I'm kind of throwing this in here because it's important. Jesus, Jesus is so strong, he resurrected himself. <laughs> but he's dead. But he did. 
He resurrected himself. That's a... How is that even possible? Dead things are dead. But then there was life. That's a one true king, yes or no? Oh man, Matthew 28, verse 6. He is not here. He is risen from the dead. And I like this phrase a lot. Just as he what? It wasn't a surprise to him either. It wasn't like, oh man, I'm alive again. <laughs> it was, he predicted it. He died, allowed himself to be dead for three days, and in an instant defeated. Come on, say that's the one true king. He is the king over death itself, which is why, once again, I'm going to go back to fear or worry or stress. Why are you bothered about your bills? He's the one true king. If he can conquer death, I'm sure he can take care of a bill. Yes or no? Why, why, why are you so bothered about this situation or that situation or this issue? Or you're laying in bed at night and your brain's going 100 miles an hour and I can't pop. Like, oh my gosh, you follow the one true king. He conquered death. You got nothing to worry about. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. We follow the one true king. He can come on, say, he can conquer anything. Number 10, Jesus' final words proves he is the one true king. Remember, because Matthew's on an agenda, so he starts at the beginning with the ancestry. You know the last thing he says in the book of Matthew? Because he's just trying to prove this one thing. He gets to the very end of the book, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Jesus came and spoke to them one more time saying, all what? All authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I run the universe. I have the authority of heaven. I have authority on earth. What are you so stressed about? What are you so worried about? I run the world. I run the universe. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, therefore please go and make disciples of all nations. This is why you got to tell everybody. Because there's one true king and so many people are living in terror and tyranny of lesser kings. They're stressed out and worried and freaked out as they worship money. They're bothered and fearful as they worship politics. They're angry as their business doesn't go as fast and as furious as they thought it would. The evidence of who your king is is whether or not your life flows in Holy Spirit power, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It just comes out of you because of who's in charge of you. Come on, say authority. When he is in charge of your life and you are in submission to him, there's a whole different level of living. So now we got to apply it. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up with some application. I have three questions we're going to ask. First question is this. Number one, if Jesus is the one true king, I got I to gotta go back to the throne picture. Who sits on the throne of your life? From age about three or four until age 17, I sat on the throne of my own life. I ran it my way. I did what I wanted to do. By the time I hit 17, I was depressed, angry, bitter, frustrated, rebellious. I was anywhere but where it was, where it was healthy or good. And then there was a moment where I, I kneeled to the one true king and the miracle happened. I started to change. I got adjusted. I didn't, I didn't do it on my own. It's because of who I knelt before. It's who was sitting there. I got off the throne of my life and I put Christ on it. Now, since then, you know the amount of times I've had to realize, oh crud, I sat back down on that throne. A lot. And then I had to kneel again and put him back on the throne because every time I put myself there, my life just, it always messes up. Who knows what I'm talking about? Can I see your hands? Oh man, we get it, we get it. If Christ is here, we're at peace because the Prince of Peace is ruling. When we are there, the Prince of Chaos rules. 
or anger or bitterness or jealousy or... Jesus says it like this, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He says, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny but before my Father in heaven. And what he's saying is there, there has to be a, come on, say public declaration. There's got to be a moment where you choose and you don't care who anybody, anybody else knows. You confess with your mouth, Romans says, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead. My guess is, is there's some people here tonight that maybe, maybe you call yourself Christian. Maybe sometimes you act a little Christian, but really the wrong ones rule in your life. There's a wrong king on that throne. You gotta put Christ back in charge of that thing, man. Just for a second, can you close your eyes and bow your head? I just want you to analyze your own heart, your own life. I want you to think through whether or not Jesus sits on the throne of your life in every area. Does he sit on the throne of your sex life? Does he sit on the throne of your financial life? Does he sit on the throne of your family life? Does he sit on the throne of your business life? Is Christ the one on the throne? Jesus says, if you'll confess with your mouth, publicly declare me that you are his. So I'm gonna lead us in a simple prayer. I'm gonna invite you to pray it out loud all over the room. Just say, Jesus Christ, I put you back on the throne of my life. Every area is yours. I kneel before you. Whatever you wanna do with me is fine. I trust that you are a better king. You are my savior and God. In Jesus' name, amen. So the image we put along with that is baptism because baptism is one of those clear evidences that you've actually put Christ on the throne of your life. If you've never been baptized, you come see Pastor Silas right here in the front as soon as service is over and we'll happily baptize you. They're like, man, I know I gotta do that. Maybe you got baptized as a baby. That's awesome, I'm so glad your parents thought it would be cool if you followed Jesus, but you didn't make that choice. In the scriptures, people choose that as adults. So if you'd like to be baptized, you come see him. But I got two more questions before we wrap it up. Second question is this, number two. If Jesus is the one true king, will you seek his kingdom above your own? Well, come on, say, seek his kingdom. A lot of his verses were around that concept. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first my kingdom, he said, and my righteousness, and then everything else will be taken care of. Come on, say Christ first. Every area, Christ first. Matthew 6, 10, this is the way he taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And I'm just going to make an observation. In order for Christ's kingdom to come many times, our kingdom got to go. You got to release control. You got to stop trusting your own way. You got to stop running after your own stuff. In order for his kingdom to come, your kingdom many times has got to go. So some of you, maybe you heard that first point, but you're still just like, you're just like, but everything but this, everything but this. No, no. God's got a better boyfriend for you than the one that's going to jack up your life. God knows your future. God's got a better plan. God's got a better future than you can ever imagine. But you got, there, there's, just, there's just things you got to be willing to release in order for you to get the blessing. Does that make sense? And then third, come on, say one true king. If Jesus is our one true king, will you proclaim his kingdom to other people? Because remember, the reason why Matthew wrote the book, come on, say, reach your friends. That's why he wrote the book. Now, don't, don't put your stuff down. No, just, just stay with me. Just, just say real clear. The whole reason why we're reading the book of Matthew is because 2,000 years ago in 62 AD, a dude was like, I'm going to die soon and my friends don't know Jesus. I'm going to go be with Jesus, but my friends don't know Christ. And so he began to write. He's like, if I could get this message to them, if I could get this message to them, if I could get this message to them, if I could get this message to them. And he thought like Jesus enough to reach them. 
Matthew 28, the last thing he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You have a people group to reach like Matthew had a people group to reach. There's somebody that you're called to take the gospel to. Here's the thing, four weeks from today, everybody say four weeks, is our fall kickoff. Now, some of you are like, I don't, I don't know what fall kickoff even means. What does that mean? It basically means it's bring your friend, week, bring your friend to church weekend. Look at the person next to you and say, it's bring your friend to church weekend. So four weeks from today, like Matthew, like Matthew wrote a book and reached millions. Will you just bring someone to hear the gospel four weeks from today? We gave you, on the way in the door, we gave you a little bracelet that looks like this, a little blue bracelet with the gospel message on it. We're inviting you to give this out to one person this week. Invite them to church, tell them what those arrows mean. If you do that next weekend, here's what we're gonna do with the doors on the way in. We're gonna ask you if you gave your bracelet out. If you did, we're gonna give you a white one. As evidence, you're gonna reach a family member, you're gonna reach a friend. So we're gonna give you a blue, you all got a blue one. If you didn't get it, get it on the way out. Yep. On, next week, we're gonna give everybody a white one. We're gonna do this all in the next four weeks. So we're gonna give you blue ones. Give them away, we'll give you a white one. Give the white ones away too. <laughs> uh, secondly, we gave you seven invite cards for fall kickoff, four weeks from today. So you got seven little invite cards, one for every day of the week, this week. And we're asking you to give this out to family members and friends and invite somebody to church. I just talked to a guy just right before as service was going on and he said he's bringing a guy to, fall, to the fall retreat to hear the gospel. That's awesome, that's beautiful. Just think about, you have, Matthew had a friend group. Come on, say, I got a friend group. So we gave you bracelets, we gave you cards. Most importantly, we gave you the Word of God. And when we empower the Word of God with the Spirit of God, you can go be like Matthew and reach somebody too. I invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. So if you have those cards, hold them up. Hold them up. We're going to pray a blessing over them that we would be Matthew to our world. Lord Jesus, tonight we have come to church to worship you knowing that you have great things in store for our family and friends. Like you reached Matthew and anybody can come to God, you can reach them. Anybody can come to God. So may you use these cards, may you use our testimony, may you use those bracelets, may you use the words of our mouth. May we pray in faith that we can reach somebody else. And Lord Jesus, at the end of the day, Four weeks from today, may many people come in the door that, that weekend on Bring Your Friend to Church weekend. Hear the gospel, be transformed. God, we're grateful we were in your house and we thank you for the book of Matthew. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's just end with our final blessing. Say this out loud with me. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. I love you. We're doing a big picnic out there. Grab some food. Hang out for a little bit and meet somebody. Glad you came to church tonight.